So hello to my athletes. I'm sitting here on this lovely, warm, summery day. And today I am so, so excited to share the upcoming piece of content with you. Now, this is a three-part series and the introduction is going to be the same for for each of the parts. But really, this guide is how you can work on your basketball IQ, no matter where you are in the world, uh, from the comfort of your own phone. You can basically have the world's best basketball coach in your pocket. And I know it sounds almost too good to be true, but I guarantee you that it is not. It is the secret that all of the greatest players of all time have utilized to really optimize their success. Um, And that secret is watching film and watching game clips and understanding why watching film is the thing that will, you know, 10x your basketball development. I say in, in the last video that I really firmly believe that watching film and understanding how to watch film regularly can two to five times your basketball. And I'd probably extend that up to 10 times it can really, really speed up your development when you know what you're looking for. And when you get into the habit of watching film, it it only needs to take, you know, you could take five minutes every now and again to watch a certain type of film, whether it was, you know, watching the skill practice, as we talk about with the mirror neurons. And then some days you might take a 30 minute session to really critically analyze your own film. Other days you might take an hour to watch a whole game and critically analyze the pieces. Any kind of Mac or you know, iPhone and stuff like that has the tools to be able to look through film, clip it up and create your own highlight reels. And there's so, so many highlight reels available on YouTube now. There's literally no excuse for any player not to be watching film regularly. And I think the reason that most players don't do it is because they don't believe that it's going to work. I guarantee you it does work. The motor learning and the science behind it shows it. The fundamental concept behind watching film that allows us to improve is this idea of motor learning, uh, particularly something known as a mirror neuron. So mirror neurons are really, really powerful and allow us to see something happening and then sort of replicate the same areas of the brain that would be being used when we're actually performing that skill. That helps us to become more familiar with a particular skill. And then there's the other component of basketball and someone like LeBron James has actually been quoted as saying, when I play basketball, I don't actually feel like I'm playing basketball anymore. I'm simply expressing myself. And he's also said, I think the game a whole lot more than I play it. So at the highest level of basketball and at the higher levels of basketball, players aren't necessarily thinking about what they're doing. And when they're out there playing, they're sort of going, when they're actually acting and doing the skills, they're not necessarily thinking about the execution of it. What they're thinking about is the tactical strategic components that go into the game. They instinctually know where their players are going to be. They know the plays. They don't have to think about the plays. They inherently cut in the right way. And it's because they've watched themselves play thousands and thousands of times. They've watched just about every scenario unfold in basketball. And that really is what basketball IQ is. It's understanding the fundamental patterns that repeat themselves in basketball and becoming more and more familiar with that. A really good analogy would be something like chess, where in chess, you know, chess players simply watch things unfold. And by seeing that happen over and over again, they become better at chess. And in basketball, it's essentially the same thing. Obviously, there's an athletic component involved in it, but the basketball IQ element is so, so crucial. And watching film in the way that we're going to go through in this article and in these subsequent videos, depending on which part you're watching, will really, really help you to start to dig deeper into this. So I'm super excited to share it with you. I know it's going to have a massive impact. And I wish I only started doing this a year ago. I wish I had this when I first started out in my basketball career and I would have avoided so many mistakes and enjoyed playing that much more. Um, I think a really cool thing that I always talk about, just to say one last thing, is that when I was a teenager, I got bored pretty often. You know, you'd be watching The Simpsons and watching random cartoons, but it's like, instead of that, why not spend that time watching basketball, watching film, and actually improving your game and living out your dream? So that is my challenge to you guys if you're watching this. Take a look, take heed of the information, watch your own games, and instead of Netflix, instead of paying for a Netflix subscription, go for free and get yourself access to YouTube on your mobile or on your computer or whatever and start watching game film. It will transform your game, I promise you. A really great video here following up on what we did the other day where we sort of looked at individual highlights and how to watch film and individual clips and sort of what I'm looking for when I'm watching it to notice you know, optimal things for skill development. Now, really what I want to point 
the attention to is the quote that I mentioned in the knees over toes article, which was really, you know, for younger players, I recommend watching an even mix of three parts, full games, your favorite players highlights at 25% speed and your own footage. Now, this is an excerpt from an article that we've written and <clears throat> I just want to scroll across so here's our sort of practice guides and a lot of the concepts that we use in our advanced three-on-three coaching um, and for our team. So this is just a, a guide from what we use and it's really useful to identify and pick up the key patterns that you see in three-on-three. So if you're interested in that, get in touch with the Sydney Supersonics and reach out to us because we run through that. Uh, we're going to be sharing player resources with players as we progress through. Um, and, you know, we'll be incorporating all of these concepts into our games. As you can see, you know, transition defense, packing, picking up off the pass. Um, we're going to be incorporating all of these into our training sessions over time. As you can see, it's sort of like we've got a 10-week syllabus, 10 different sessions where um, we're really going hard on the unique aspects of 3-on-3 three three and in, um, incorporating those into the trainings for different levels, depending on what kind of player you are. Um, and I just wanted to go through that and preface this whole video with that to say that, you know, three on three is a unique game. And the more you watch it, the more you will understand these things. And what we're going to have is some video resources that, you know, show these teaching points in action. Um, but to speed up that development and for your own purposes, I really want to go through, you know, why watching film is so important and what I'm looking for. Now, as I've alluded to in some of the prior articles, you know, watching film is, in my mind, one of the things, if not the thing, that will separate an athlete who is good from an athlete who is truly great, from an athlete who knows the game, from an athlete who has amazing basketball IQ. And, you know, one of the main reasons for that is because watching film invokes what is known as a mirror neuron. So by watching the film, we're actually improving and getting better as a result of that. And so that is massive and something that cannot be understated. Um, and so that applies sort of more to watching individual skill sets, but watching a full game allows you to sort of step into the shoes of the players when you're watching it intently. And this is the key thing. It must be done sort of deliberately. If we look at the definition of deliberate practice, which we refer to in the blueprint and in the love of the game courses all the time, deliberate practice must be effortful and it must be on a specific focus. To sit there and just simply lounge back and watch a game with your mates is sort of beneficial, but it's not going to be in the same vein as watching a game intently. And so there's a number of ways that I like to watch a game um, to identify key aspects. And so I'm just going through two of my favorite teams to watch play in three on three, which is Serbia, the, the global powerhouse and arguably the greatest team um, of the last decade and France, who are a very athletic, very quick team. Um, and these two teams play a style of three-on-three three that is probably most achievable for a lot of players to start picking up. And so I just want to point out some of the key things that I'm looking for and go through how I watch it. Um, and this is really going to improve sort of the fourth pillar of your athleticism, which is the specific tactical and strategic prep. Now, that pillar number four um, sort of comes after the third pillar, which is sporting specific skill. And the other thing that I want to mention about that pillar is that it's otherwise known as sort of basketball IQ. And the best way to improve basketball IQ is to watch basketball and understand what's going on so that you can put yourself in the shoes of the players. And, you know, basketball IQ is really just about being able to recognize intuitively and subconsciously, unconsciously, what you're seeing in front of you on the court and make the right decision at the right time. And the only, well, the best way to do that is by playing, but the best way to do that at volume, because you can only get a certain amount of games in per week. Um, really, you can only play, if you're trying to be a high level athlete and balance all of the needs of training, you can only really play two or three good quality games in a week. Um, and so that's where watching film becomes absolutely invaluable because you can play or get the equivalent of, say, 10 games in a week by watching film, um, and then you speed up the development curve and your ability as a player exponentially. So that's enough sort of theory to 
articulate why this is important, but let's go into just watching some of this clip here. And again, these are two of the best teams in the world for three on three, and we'll just pick up what we notice. So as you can see, there's a lot going on in three on three, and there's a lot of sort of screening actions and fast movements, and it can pay to watch at full speed and just notice what happens. And it's quite hard to commentate sort of play by play. You notice like it's, it's really hard to sort of notice what's going on. Um, you tend to watch the guy with the ball and typically in three on three, like a lot of scores come from, you know, quickly getting open off quick screens. And it's hard to actually notice what they did in each moment. Like say, for example, this move here, how did he actually get by uh, Ratkov so easily? And if you note here, he's driving down. It looks like he's got it. He's beat him to the spot. And what he does is goes into Ratkov, bumps off, has a nice step through and under, and misses the bunny, unfortunately. Um, and so that is sort of why I like to watch three on three at full speed is to understand you know, how the game is played at the highest level. Because when you watch lower level three on three games, um, the best way to watch you know official three on three game is to compare it to a lower level three on three game. And you watch some lower level three-on-three three games, um, such as Ball Up 3x3. Um, and I'll find some lower-level games here. Um, UK. Um, here we go. Let's put this on. Let's see this basketball, England. All right. So not saying that England is a lower level of play or anything like that, but just these teams are more junior. And so when you watch them playing, it is very much more stagnant, ISO type ball, um, teams that haven't played a lot. And so when we go through here, I mean, backwards caps on, pulling up for those kinds of shots and just it's a lot more ego based. They're not used to playing it. It's a bit messy. Um, but I... Don't want to point out or linger on this too much, um, but comparing sort of three on three at the lower levels to the higher levels is really a good way to understand you know, your own limitations. And this is where coming and watching your own games, which I'm going to do a little section on, um, really can help. But you see these players are settling for these tough contested ones. They're bunched up, not much spacing and not a lot of movements, simply just kind of standing around. Um, and it, look, it's not to say that this is not, these aren't great players. They just don't necessarily know how to play three on three. Um, and so a lot of ISO ball, you know, not a lot of movement to get open, just simply taking shots and hitting big shots. And so, look, these guys are great players, absolutely. But it's, it's hard to win consistently against the best team. So I don't want to spend too long on this, but it's just highlighting sort of the difference between two of the best teams in the world versus some teams who have very good individual players, but they're not going to be competing at the top levels. And you can see why. And the reason is, you know, they don't move as well. They don't sync up as a team and they're looking individually to score instead of playing as a team. And that's one of the things that will improve your basketball IQ and ability to play in a team and tactically exponentially. Um, and so that's what I really want to point out when watching these games is that you're looking at teams playing well together and noticing the things that you need to do to play in a system. Um, and that really is the, the big thing with three on three. So you see here, plenty of spacing. Um, they hold their ground and they're really keeping it well. Now, sort of, it's hard to watch in fast motion is, is what I want to get to next. You can watch games in fast motion occasionally just to get an idea of how quick it is. But I find to get the most benefit from watching a three on three game, I actually like to put it into um, a slower speed. So 2.5 times speed may seem painfully slow for this video. However, when watching it and sort of sitting back and giving yourself, say, 10 minutes a day to watch it at 2.5 times speed, you notice things that you wouldn't have otherwise noticed. So let's see what we're noticing here. So see Vasic is dribbling it out. Now, a lot of players would just sort of Dribble straight out to this corner, but Vasic is holding his ground because he sees Paisalic is there, and Paisalic is able to push off of this gentleman here. I believe it is. I don't remember his name, but he's able to push off and see 
he's sort of thrown a no look to Ratkov there. A small thing, but you notice what happens after this play. So they're holding their ground. Yeah, the spacing isn't too great. Paisalis runs off towards Ratkov and then directs the man, making sure that he goes into that screen, gets the foul call. So, you know, it's a really great play there from Paisalic. And it's, it's a small thing to notice what he did. But see here, he runs straight toward the French player. He doesn't, a lot of players would just run straight off Rakov and go through this. And I mean, it's really easy for this defender to read it. So he'd go off the handoff, run straight off him, and it would be easily covered. Whereas what Pasalic is doing is running straight, basically at Rakov. Like you see this angle here and Rakov's getting it for the handoff. And handoff is a key for M3 play, which you don't notice in the lower levels as well. Um, but he's running straight into him and noticing that he's physical and because he, this guy doesn't want Pytalich to get a shot up because he's a shooter. So why I'm sort of focusing so much on this specific thing as well is because there is, this is the beauty of basketball. There is so much going on at once in any one game that you're never going to be able to pick up everything because what you're essentially dealing with is, you know, 20 years of experience for each of these guys. So where we got a total of 120 years of collective basketball experience in action and the thought processes behind that at play with different skill sets and different thought patterns going on. Um, and so all of these guys are really, you know, expressing the art form that is basketball for them. And it's really important to note what each player is doing and put yourself in the shoes of the players that you're most likely going to fill the roles of. Because, you know, when you're watching it, you're never going to be able to pick up what all six guys are doing at once. Like, what's this defender thinking? Okay, what? Should he be a little bit further in? Like, if this was a 5 on 5 game, you'd probably see this defensive player up in the lane. But he's not up in the lane because if he was up in the lane, then he'd get back door cut. Um, but there's no help there. So, you know, that's a really intricate and un- intricate way to defend that you might not understand if you're used to playing 5-on-5. Five five. And so you want to try and step into the shoes of the player that you are trying to emulate. And that's why watching games is always going to be beneficial. You can watch the same game 20 times and pick up something different every time because there's six different things going on at once that you're going to have to pick up. Um, and so, you know, as we can see, there's a really, really great thing from Paisal he doesn't want to get the shot up and then he draws that foul. And in 3-on-3, three three, you know, that's a not an easy thing to do to draw a foul. Um, it's just a side note here, how great is this location right in front of the Eiffel Tower in Paris? Um, but anyway, as we go, we watch this here. A pass off the elbow, very common set off the elbows. Great screen there from Rakov. Now watch this re-screen. Beautiful move. Gets that for the jump shot. Wide open. Very nice. You know, that is the kind of move that you just do not see um, in a 5 and 5 setting. And if you didn't pay attention to what was going on, it's almost like he sort of sees this screen here. So most players would just come straight off this. That was a good screen from Rakov. You know, you, you come straight off it. But he sees the guy still with him. So then he turns back and re-screens. He doesn't see it coming. He has not enough time. Fontaine does not have enough time to pick up Pysalic, and he gets a good shot. Now, for a shooter like Pysalic, that's a great shot. Um, and in three on three, you're going to back him to make that sort of more often than not. Um, and then they both crash the boards. Pysalic is there. Easy one pointer. And that is another thing to note about three on three. So, this is what I'm looking for when I'm watching the game. You know, I'm looking at, okay, what happened in this possession? How did. Because if you're watching it at fast motion, you just say, oh, Paisalos gets your shot, misses it, rebound, whatever, you skip on. But how did that actually come about? All right, so he takes the shot. He gets fouled, actually. And he knows he's been fouled. So he runs in and Pontens, actually, it's not Pontens. Uh, this play here is contested. So he's flown over there. So he knows he's uncontested. And what he's kind of gambled on, so he's out here because in 5-on-5, five five you'd crash the boards. But in this instance, he's flaring out to the corner because he knows that likely that shot is going in or his player's going to get the rebound. And then he will be open because this guy's a shooter. So that's why he's standing out on the three-point line. It looks like he's bludging. And it's sort of a gamble from Pysalic because it would have left him open. But pays off for him. 
gets the rebound and gets the easy score. And now you see the transition. So he's open, flaring out. Let's notice open jump shot there. Um, what happens? Does he make it? He makes that. So that's an easy shot. And like that's the power of transition in round three. Look at this. Really great score, but because of the defense, I mean, this was a bit of a miscommunication. Let's see why he gets so open. So Rakov, what he needs to do, he did a good job kind of shielding him off. Um, what he needs to do is see that a bit earlier to get out there. I mean, I guess he kind of dares him to shoot it. And he shoots it, and it goes in. Unlucky for Rakov, but that's the gamble he played. And that was sort of the decision he's making. And these are the things that you just don't pick up when you're watching it normally. So we'll go through a couple more plays here, uh, a couple more rounds. And so Pyshalich is dribbling out. Notice how he's shielding off with his body. Again, still shielding off. Clears up over the top. And that wasn't a great pass, to be honest. I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of that. Like the jumping away pass to the post. Doozy of a foul call. Um, unlucky for Ato. But, you know, let's go through this next one. So this same horn set, what's Paisalo's going to do? He's a great, very good at running off these screens. Look at this. Pushes him down. Pushes him into it. This is a bit of a crumble. But uses it as a screen. Maestro. It's a tough shot up. Look, I'm not sure about that, but, I mean, Maestrovic is one of the greatest players of three and three history, so he can get away with that. Um, but let's see what they do in this transition piece here. So we're noticing he's coming out to set the screen. Pontens is dribbling it out the top. That backdoor cut. Great switch there. Great switch. Um, Pontens is looking, looking. This is another thing I want younger players to notice is how Pontens is, is dribbling this out. So he sees... Yeah, he knows that he's to a covered. So he's like, oh, I'm just going to dribble it out. But the whole time he's dribbling it out, he's seeing these players. So then he quickly turns around, noticing, noticing, and he's using his body to shelter it off and holding that really, really well. I was going to say, it looked like a bit of a carry there, but there's been a foul call. So what do we go here again? We'll do this as the last play. So... Squaring him up. He's not guarding him, so he's in this nice athletic stance. Triple threat position. Ball protected. Probably doesn't need to protect it so much because Vasic isn't much of an outside defender. But, I mean, this guy could probably take Vasic. Vasic isn't super quick. He's just big. Um, but what he's doing is he's looking for these two players here. And so he's going through. And this is where a lot of players can put themselves in the shoes of this guy and not rush their triple threat. You know, look for what they're after. Now, notice... Here he sets a delayed screen, comes off that screen, and to be fair there, there probably was an opportunity for a re-screen. Um, I don't know too much about that shot. It's a bit of a tough shot, but yeah, the results uh, with it, you know, there, there could have been an opportunity for a re-screen there and then getting a bit better look for this gentleman here. But let's see where they go from here. Um, and this is one thing with Serbia. They always know how they're executing out of each play. So Pontens is... So he's taking Vasic. Um, well, there's a good defense from Vasic there, but yeah, a bit of a foul call. Kind of moves a bit late. Um, all right, let's get one more score in. So passing it into the elbow. Holding in a nice, strong position here. Hands are up. They're running the shooter off Pontens. It's not a bad play. Runs off a double curl and then cuts to the basket. This is great. Sees him open. Pontens. I don't know if he's going to shoot it. He does shoot it. And do we have a bucket? We have a great look though. So let's break this one down under the microscope. So... He's seeing, he's coming off, and look at this. This is one thing I want to point out. So this is a great way to run a handoff off of an elbow set, or off of any set, really. This player's holding it, and he's not, he's not even dribbling it. He hasn't even dribbled, but look at how much 
ground he's covering to set this up. He steps out of his pivot foot and uses his butt, so this is a butt screen, to just create like this wall for his player. Not a moving screen. Create this wall. He's got a great screen, but he sees Mastorovich is well over it, so he's covering it too much, and he's like, man, I'm, I'm slipping. So he sees Mastorovich is nowhere near him, and he is slipping straight to the bucket, and this slip, so that big screen, to then quickly slip it without holding it. Like a lot of players would just hold this screen to then slip to the basket. Ato can see him. Mystorovic covers down. Ratkov is worried about that because he doesn't want him to score. So he's like, oh, I'm going to drop down. And then that slip is what creates this wide open look for three. And Pontanes has got to make that. Ratkov's dared him to shoot it, I guess. But he's got to make that. And that is how that shot gets created. So it gets created from a great sort of moving dribble handoff early, setting a big, strong screen, and then realizing that Mystorovic is too over the top and quickly diving at the bucket. That is a three-on-three principle, diving to the bucket. Because there is no help defender, um, it completely opens up the lane and those kinds of dynamics to be a lot more, I guess, shifty as a, a non an off-ball player. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm looking for when watching a three-on-three -three game. Now, it does definitely pay to watch a three-on-three -three game at full speed as well. Um, and let's just run this while I sort of conclude the video. But it does certainly pay to watch it at full speed because, you know, you're watching these things happen and so many things uh, you don't notice. Now, I've done some scoring breakdowns of typical three-on-three -three games in the past. And, you know, probably 50%, anywhere from 30 to 60% of the game is scored from behind the two-point arc. Um, so the three-pointers or the two-point shots are a massive part of the game. Um, but it can't be discounted. You know, it's based on the individual personnel of each team. And the defensive intensity that you're watching it at, um, I think probably offensively you want to watch it at uh, lower speeds. But defensively, you want to watch it at full speeds to just notice how intense they play defense. Um, because, you know, you just see how quickly they're moving and going and um, how quickly things happen. And a, a mix of sort of watching it at slow speeds and watching it at full speeds is going to level up your game tremendously. And if you can put yourself in the shoes of the players and then use the lessons that you learn from watching the games in your real life game scenarios, um, then over time, you can start to pose yourself these questions about, okay, well, I'm not able to score very easily in three on three or my team doesn't seem to be winning or I don't seem to be getting a lot of open shots. Why might that be? Um, and then by watching games and just continuing to refine your own play style, um, the better you can get at really nailing in on uh, how to refine your game over time. This is what Kobe Bryant used to speak about. He was like, every week, he'd just have a new puzzle to solve, a new question to ask. It's like, hey, look, I'm not getting many of these shots. How can I score more? What, are they, what mistakes did I make? And so really marrying this up to the individual skill sets that you need to learn, um, using your personal blueprint, which is in our blueprint, as to how to assess the skills that you need, and then comparing it to the footage of your own games. Um, the more of those you can watch, the better. So really use the footage of your own games to... Firstly, when you play a game, you pick up the blind spots, particularly if you're meditating after the game, you can pick up the blind spots and notice you know, where you might have been going wrong. And then you can watch the footage of your games and pick up other things that you didn't even notice before. Watch your own games in slow motion. Watch what the best players on the floor are doing. And then notice those particular elements in the players on the... Um, in the game that you're watching and slow it down, you know, say there's a, a guy who plays a position like you would, I'd probably be playing the position of uh, Ratkov or uh, Vasic. And so I'm watching for what they're doing in different scenarios to understand, okay, well, what are the best players in the world doing? How are they running different sets and how can I um, improve my game based on the weaknesses I identified in my own performance? And so, you know, that really is the process. There's no art to it, but uh, eventually over time, you get much better at identifying the things that you can do in your own game. As always, thank you so much for tuning in. Just a quick little message from me, Ben Killen, the current number two ranked round three player in Australia. Uh, as you may or may not know, the content that 
exists within this sort of sits within the ultimate course that I've created, which is the Elite Athlete Blueprint, which is the course which really kind of breaks down the signs of becoming an elite athlete. Now, uh, if you're interested in more about that, you can check the link in the bio below, and that will have all the details you need, as well as the associated resources. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you uh, really enjoyed this tutorial on how to watch film, and it really helps you to level up your game.